uno, dos, tres, uno, uno, dos, tres. Pero échate para acá. Ya Allí se encuentra uno de los policías que comenzó esta. Allí se encuentra uno de los policías que comenzó esta hoguera. A breathtaking act of violence on the streets of Los Angeles plays live on national television. This is no cops and robbers movie. It's real. Two armed men have hit a North Hollywood bank and seem to be cornered by police. But these two haven't just turned up to rob a bank. Dressed like post-apocalyptic warriors, they take on the police with calculated savagery, blasting them with vastly superior firepower. Their purpose was to kill law enforcement that day and send a message to other agencies that we can't be stopped. The hour of the North Hollywood shootout would convulse America. The sight of two paramilitary-style gunmen declaring war on a suburban street would raise the bar for criminal violence and ratchet up the climate of fear. For the gunmen themselves, this is the hour to act out their twisted take on the American dream. Larry Phillips Jr. and Emil Matasarenu seek instant wealth and fame live on the morning news. Los Angeles on a cool, clear winter's morning. As nine o'clock approaches, the Friday rush hour is subsiding, and on Laurel Canyon Boulevard in North Hollywood, the Bank of America will open its doors for the busiest day of the week. When hundreds of hourly paid workers come in to cash their paychecks. This will be the main battleground for an urban war which will also be fought out on a nearby street called Archwood, at a dentist's office in a shopping mall, and around a key-making kiosk. A house deep in the suburbs of LA. Inside are two out-of-work misfits, who, within the next hour, will achieve international notoriety. Strewn around the house are automatic rifles, ammunition, hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash, and copies of the movie Heat, which famously portrays a violent bank robbery that spills onto the streets of Los Angeles and turns into a running gun battle with the police. Emil Matasarenu is 30 years old, but reportedly immature for his age. He's a loner whose one good friend has not been well chosen, Larry Phillips Jr. Phillips, who's 26, is a skilled conman and the son of a small-time crook from Denver. On the morning of February the 27th, both are known to have taken phenobarbital, an epilepsy drug that interferes with nerve signals to the brain and slows body movement. Phillips and Matasarenu have already committed a string of increasingly brutal robberies, stealing more than $1.5 million from banks and armored trucks and killing a security guard in cold blood. The robbers have always used the same method of attack, assault rifles, black paramilitary outfits, and no hesitation in resorting to extreme violence. Opening time at the Bank of America on Laurel Canyon. And Juan Villagrana, the assistant branch manager, leaves his desk to unlock the main doors. He is one of about 20 staff on duty today. Good 
morning. Come on in. On Friday mornings, bank employees are on heightened alert. It's a bank robber's favorite time to strike because the safes are usually filled with extra payday cash. Phillips and Matasarenu strap on customized bulletproof vests. Phillips has protection for his legs as well. But Matasarenu, at 283 pounds, is perhaps too overweight to move freely with leg armor. The body armor weighs less than the chips on their shoulders. Both have been in trouble with the law. Phillips had been caught three times trying to pull property scams and had been barred from working as a real estate agent. Matasarenu was accused of assaulting a patient in his mother's care home and eventually the home was forced to close. Both men believe the authorities are out to get them. Shaking down banks must seem a perfect career choice for two outcasts obsessed with money and powerful weapons. And a hatred for cops. 11825, They now head for a confrontation that both are determined to win, whatever the cost. On Laurel Canyon, the Bank of America is serving its first customers. Security guards keep a watchful eye for any signs of trouble. With cash reserves at their highest, the hour after opening on Fridays can be the most dangerous time. In a shopping mall across the street from the bank, dentist Jorge Montes is getting ready for his first patients. He thinks it's going to be a quiet day. His appointment book is only half full. I've been in practice for over 25 years, but I have been in my location in North Hollywood for the past 17 years. My wife also practices with me. Her name is Dr. Teresa Romero, and I have a staff of around five. And that day, everyone was there except for our patients. Phillips and Matasarenu make the turn into Archwood Street. They are now just a few hundred meters from the bank. They have planned their raid in detail, even calculating how much money should be in the vault. But there are some big holes in their scheme. Both are loners and don't know anyone in the criminal underworld who could launder the stolen cash. They don't even have a getaway driver. The robber's aging car arrives at the bank's north parking lot. The engine is left running. If they were interested in stealing cash and making a quick escape, they could do it with little more than a couple of pistols. But they carry more than 60 pounds of guns, armor and ammunition into the bank. Two LA police officers cruise along Laurel Canyon Boulevard. They're about to play a crucial role in the North Hollywood shootout. They catch a glimpse of the bank raid, just as it begins. Did you see that? See what? We got a bank robbery. Pull over. Oh, shit. This is the hold 
Everybody get down to the ground! Close your eyes and don't look! Get your head down! If you move, I will kill you! Mata Serenu strikes 79-year-old Mildred Nolte over the head. You don't want to die. Get all the way down to the He then floor. threatens another bank customer, Javier Orozco. Security requesting assistance. We've got a possible two in progress. And we're in a police car out on the street. And they heard these shots being fired inside a closed bank. That's how loud they were. Shots fired, Bank of America, Laurel Canyon, north of Kittredge. When we first arrived, we saw the black and white, which was the original officers that saw the men go into the bank. Detective Tracy Angeles and her partner, John Krulak, arrive within two minutes of the first call that a robbery is in progress. John and I elected to go into the west parking lot directly across from the bank. You see anything? Not yet. There was a key shack at the edge of the sidewalk, and Dr. Montez's office was there. Well, there's no getaway or layoff people I can see. There was no sense of panic in anybody, so we started thinking that maybe this could be a false alarm or, you know, could be one guy with a handgun, something that, you know, we would have total control over. Inside the bank, Matasarenu threatens a security guard. Ah. If you move, I'll kill you. When I tell you, I want you to move all these people to the vault. You got it! Phillips moves to breach the last line of safety for the bank staff, a reinforced glass security door. Sergeant Larry Dean Haynes stops his car just north of the bank. In the next few minutes, he will be the first Los Angeles police officer to discover how lethally dangerous the robbers really are. 15 out 40. We have more shots fired inside the bank. Montez's first patient is now overdue. You know what? We have no patience. There's four cops hiding outside. They're aiming their guns to the bank. We all went to the windows to see what was going on. Well, to the north side, I had seen three cop cars. To the south side of the bank, I had seen another few cop cars. This is going to end really quick. I figured they're going to come out. They're going to be surrounded. It's going to end. We just expected to see another regular bank robbery because this was about the fifth bank robbery that we were witnessing. And our, our patients usually say, oh, look, at those guys are running out there. And so we expected the same thing. When we were behind the key shack, it was myself, Detective John Krulak, Officer Stuart Guy, and Officer James Aboravan. Because we were five minutes away, we were one of the first police units that arrived at the scene, and we positioned ourselves directly across the street from Bank of America. Stuart Guy is supervising James Aborovan, a trainee with just two months' experience on the force. Let's check my partner. How are we doing? Good. Are you locked and loaded? I am, and I've got a clear target. Okay, stay hidden. Going back on academy training, you were looking for good cover, good concealment, for when, at some point, they were going to exit the bank, stereotypically with, you know, a gun in one hand, bag of money in the other, you know, cops and robbers. They would see us and give up or run back in, take hostages. You, you know, you call SWAT and hopefully 12 hours later, the incident's over, you know, safely and peacefully. Oh, keys to the vault, now! Who's got them? Oh, open it. it! It takes two keys. What? It takes two keys. Who's got the other one? 
the manager. Get him! Mary, move, move! Give it to him, now! Go! Get! Open up, now! Oh! Do it! Phillips fails to spot a carefully laid trap. Hidden among the cache is a small explosive pack. Come on! It's designed to spray a blue dye over the banknotes if they're stolen, rendering them worthless. Faster! Faster! Phillips expects to get his hands on more than $800,000 in cash, but the bank had recently cut back on the money it holds in its vaults. And when only found three to four hundred thousand, they were quite upset. Spent a couple extra minutes in the bank, looking for the money, and um, actually roughing up the bank manager a little bit um, to try to ascertain where the rest of the money was, and it wasn't there. Where's the ATM money? You've got millions. The police presence near the bank grows quickly. Among the hundreds of police officers who've responded to the 211 robbery in progress call is John Caparelli. I stopped about 100, maybe 80 yards south of the bank, and the rounds were, were just going off. It was louder than I'd ever heard. He heads off to confront the gunman, armed with just his standard issue pistol. Phillips and Matasarenu have form as bank robbers. But a bizarre incident four years earlier could have cut short their violent careers. 48S, northbound Pacific and Broadway, in pursuit of a red Ford Thunderbird. Three, Romeo, Whiskey, India, 942. Request warrant and registration check. In October 1993, Ian Grimes, a Glendale robbery homicide detective, chased down a car that had spun out wildly in front of him. He was about to make a startling discovery. See me trying to pull you over? Not a purse, no. Do you have a driver's license? No, I, I don't. Why not? Must have left it at home. Sir, I want you to step out of the car and move around to the side here, please. What's your name, sir? John Doe. My name's John Doe. Uh -huh. Is this your car, Mr. Doe? This? No, this is uh, it's my mom's. Right. Sir, I want you to turn around, put your hands behind your head. I don't want you to move, you understand me? Do you have any concealed weapons? No. Stay in the car! You put your hands on the trunk, keep your feet apart. In the trunk of the car, police recovered a complete bank robbery kit, including semi-automatic guns, ammunition, gas masks and disguises. But California prosecutors were not able to secure a conviction on any serious charges. After plea bargaining, Phillips and Matasarenu were sentenced on lesser offences, including declaring a false name and carrying a concealed weapon. One of the charges was conspiracy to commit bank robbery, 
it's amazing to me that based on all the evidence at hand, um, they weren't able to garner a conviction for that. To the astonishment of many local police officers, a judge would later order that most of the weapons seized from Phillips and Matasarenu be returned to them. Security! Get up! Move! Go! Get up! What are you waiting for? Go! Go! Get it, go! What are you doing still back there? Let's go! Move! You two! Move! Move! Move it! Let's go! Eight minutes after they'd burst into the bank, the two gunmen are ready to leave. Staff and customers are forced into the vault. Fortunately for them, Matasarenu does not push the airtight door completely shut. Phillips, meanwhile, steps outside. What the hell is that? Eugene Phillips exited the bank and walked down the steps and onto the sidewalk. Dressed in all black, and all you could see was, you know, the eyes uh, cut out around his face. If Phillips is surprised by the growing police presence, he doesn't show it and calmly walks back inside the bank. We gotta go! Phillips reloads. The Battle of Laurel Canyon is about to begin. Larry Phillips Jr. walks out of the bank and transforms a routine robbery into a devastating assault on the Los Angeles police. Shit, shit. The first casualty is Dean Haynes. Dean out 40. I've been hit. You better send a tack alert here. We've got several civilians hit also. I lifted up the shotgun and fired uh, two shotgun blasts. I find out later um, I had hit him with a total of eight pellets in his, in his back. Seven absorbed into the body armor, which at the time we didn't know they had on and one actually went a little bit low and hit him in the tailbone. So right after striking him, he immediately spun, uh, locked eyes in my direction, and uh, started shooting. He grabbed me by the front of my shirt, and he said, hit the ground. Me he threw me on the ground and got on top of me. And that's when I knew that we probably were in a lot more trouble than we realized. The bullets were going through the little, the little key shack, going through the, the metal machinery inside there and exiting the back, two of which um, at that time struck me, um, one in the lower back, one in the hip that uh, exited my butt cheek. We realized that, hey, we're no contest. We, we, we cannot compete against AK-47s. The, the, uh, the rounds of bullets were literally just hitting everywhere. The, the cars, the kiosks, it, it, it was just like raindrops, except these raindrops were raindrops of death. As they're shooting, I stayed watching because I thought the gunmen are not going to shoot at the second floor. They're going to be shooting level. That's the only reason I stayed there. Now, Dr. Romero, she was more safety conscious, so she starts telling all my assistants and myself, get away from the windows, get back, get back. There were things that you thought, is it a movie? Is, is it something that's not real? You don't expect it until you start seeing blood coming from the officers. That's when I, I realized 
that this is something that we're we're in the way of these guns so when the bullets would hit our building we would duck for cover Die. It was a space that we had to cover between the key shack and the first line of parked cars. Like maybe 75 to 83 feet we had to cover of open space. So we started to run. They were in front of me. I fell. I had a radio in my left hand and I had my gun in my right hand. And when I fell, I fell hard. I went for my weapon. And when I went for my weapon, he started firing at again. I had no cover. I kept feeling that I was going to get shot in the back. I can remember thinking that I didn't want to die in that parking lot. Not like that. Detective John Kulak was shot in the, the ankle. He went down and immediately hopped back up and asked me if I was okay to run. He then put his hand on my shoulder and we started running. Stuart Guy and Tracy Angeli stay behind in the parking lot. The cars offer little protection. I can remember watching them run and trying to decide, do I run or do I stay? Tracy recalls the suspect shooting at uh, Detective Kulak and myself, the bullets hitting at our feet and sparking off the asphalt as we were running. As I jumped through the glass doors, most likely his bullets made it there before me and helped shatter it. That's why I didn't receive any you know, cuts from the glass. Detective Kulak and myself laid down on the dentist floor right at the doorway so we could look down the stairs in case the suspects decided to walk across the street towards us. Take care of him. Detective Kulak took the shotgun, pointed it down the stairs, and if, it, if the suspects came to that bottom of that stairwell, Detective Kulak would have had him um, in his sights. I right away yelled out to my staff. Bring me a yellow long, give me some gauze, give me hydrogen peroxide. It is a noise that you will never ever forget. It's deafening um, due to the close proximity of us and the shooters. You could taste the, I want to say gunpowder, I'm not sure if that's the appropriate taste that I was tasting, but it was a metallic, powdery awful burnt taste. Stuart Guy takes the full force of an armor-piercing round. My leg went up in the air like a rag doll, and it pulled me. And when the leg just, just came down, still connected by my skin to my body, it was as though somebody pulled me from my from under my legs and lifted me up and I landed with my with my buttocks against the ground like I'm sitting, but my leg completely laying to my right. When I finally find this gushing of, of blood coming out, the gash was about seven inches, it's about two inches wide, about two inches deep, and I just ripped open the shirt, and you could see this blood just starting to come out. It's instilled in you in the very beginning. You do not separate from your partner. So as we're up there and I'm being treated, I'm thinking, oh, God, I left my partner. He's down in the parking lot. I'm going to get fired. Officers down. We're in the dental surgery in the mall. Officers, guy, and ambulance. Get to the surgery. Guy tries desperately to save himself. This is coming face to face with death. Uh, there's just no other way to describe it. I was very scared, but yet I was calm. I was very calm. Tracy Angeles is just a few meters away, but is pinned down by a stream of gunfire. 
his pants were smoking like they were on fire. And there was a huge hole. Dr. Romero, my wife, is the one who brought me gloves, which I'm glad because there's blood and, and there's glass everywhere. As I'm treating Zaborvan and, and I'm putting hydrogen peroxide and there's bubbling of the blood and, and the glass, it's inside there. Now, the gash is so deep, there's a little opening into the pleural cavity where the lungs breathe. And so you can hear the, the kind of sound and the regurgitation. So I'm sticking my finger into this space just so it doesn't get into that area. I took off my big gun belt and I applied a tourniquet on my leg. I was pulling on, on that belt as, as I put on the tourniquet to slow down the bleeding, my gun in my left hand and praying with my tongue. So I was like this the whole time. When I fell in the parking lot, I felt for sure, okay, I'm, I'm gonna die. There's no way, I'm, I'm, he's firing, I have no cover and I'm not gonna survive this. And I can remember it was a pretty lonely feeling to feel that way. So I remember thinking that I didn't want Stuart to feel how I felt. No human being should ever feel that lonely. Are you okay? Can you do anything with my ankle? Let me see. And there's a piece of shrapnel, probably be about two inches sticking out of his lower right ankle. Can you pull it out? No, I don't think so. It might be too dangerous. I just don't know what I could do. Better be waiting for the hospital, okay? From being a dentist, I've had so much first aid knowledge. I didn't take it out, I left it there. I stopped some of the bleeding, hydrogen peroxide and the sterile gauze, put his sock over it. I said, we'll get to yours later. Yours isn't life threatening right now. I want to kill those bastards. You gotta get everyone to the back of the building. It's not safe here. Still bleeding heavily, the injured men are led to a storeroom at the back of the dentist's surgery. The actions of Montez and the dental surgery staff have probably saved the officers' lives. Stuart Guy and Tracy Angeles are rescued under fire by LAPD officers Todd Schmitz and Anthony Carbonock. We resorted to the training they provided us on how to do an officer rescue, and I got the bad leg. He was laying in a supine position, so we could not close the back door because the leg was out. It was hanging out of the door. We took gunfire again, and one of the tires blew. So when we got around the corner of the building and we knew we were safe, I had to close the back door because it was swinging and we were afraid it was going to hit the leg and damage the leg some more. So um, we had no choice but to tuck the leg into the car. The robbers have stolen $303,000, half a million less than they'd expected. As the battle intensifies, police helicopter pilot Charles Perigway is flying directly above the two gunmen. More police officers became involved in um, shooting at the suspects, and the suspects became more involved in shooting at, at more and more police officers and, um, unfortunately, some civilians that were in the area. I could see bullets actually impacting the torso of the suspects. Um, they were hitting the armor that they were wearing, and with each hit, you could see like a puff of smoke. They had some self-discipline about themselves. They were on some narcotics, but uh, to be in the middle of a gunfight like that and not to be running about was very unusual. Phillips and Mata Serenu head towards the getaway car its engine still running in the bank's north parking lot. A 
A remote sensor sets off the dye pack inside the bag. Leave it! The cash is now unusable. Mata Serenu is peppered with gunshot to his unprotected right leg. Barely able to walk, he retreats to the getaway car. He seems to have given up on any plan to take the battle to the police. Phillips has other ideas. Almost immediately, he takes a gunshot to his left wrist. But he seems merely to intensify the attack. I mean, we had to stop these guys. That's all I was thinking about is, you know, you just got to get in there. John Caparelli is among a small group of officers who get within 10 meters of the gunman. The AK-47 rounds just went through that wall like it wasn't even there. And we kind of regrouped at that point. Caparelli retreats and runs to what he thinks will be a more secure position on Archwood Street. They're moving the car. Yeah, on the other side of that van. The gunmen make their first move to escape. Mata Serenu, driving the car, appears at one point to implore Phillips to get in. But Phillips seems still to relish the confrontation. He switches to a high-powered Heckler & Koch rifle, a weapon well suited to attacking the police and news helicopters that now swarm above him. It was something I had happened to me before. I'm a combat veteran from Vietnam flying Marine Corps helicopters, so uh, it wasn't a new experience, but it certainly was not one that I enjoyed uh, suffering through, but we, we stayed. Phillips Heckler and Koch is damaged by a police bullet. He reverts to his AK-47 and hands Mata Serenu an M16 rifle. If somebody has a shot, take it. These are the last few seconds in which the two gunmen act as a team. Air unit, does anybody have a clear shot of those guys? The 40 guys are getting shot right back at. out of the parking lot, Phillips had at least two different jams in his weapon and he stopped to clear those jams. I don't think Montesoreno understood what was happening in that regard, that his partner was not staying abreast of him. We've got one suspect on foot, the suspect on foot is behind a long uh, trailer rig. Now, behind a car in Archwood Street, John Caparelli yet again finds he's in the line of fire. I knew these guys were getting shot at, but they just kept going. I looked to my left, and it looked to me he was still firing at the officers. I was thinking, I'm going to stop this guy finally. Here's my chance. I ran to that corner. I stopped at the corner, and I fired six rounds, and they didn't do anything. Uh, I knew some of them hit him, but he just slowly turned with the AK-47 in his hands. And I turned. That fire hydrant was in the way. It was like, I'm going right over it. And somewhere in there, his gun jammed. You know, it's just, it's, it's a miracle. Uh, it gave me those seconds somewhere in there to be able to get across the street and, and get some cover. Mata Serenu, meanwhile, struggles with an almost undrivable getaway car. He makes several attempts to hijack another vehicle. 
Remarkably, civilian cars are still driving by. We made several mistakes during this incident, and I think probably one of them that uh, we all acknowledged was uh, we didn't cordon off the area maybe as good as we could have. But having said that, um, it would have taken a lot of police cars just to barricade intersections. And uh, a lot of people, I believe, were just getting out of their house, getting in their car and driving to the market or wherever they were going. So they probably would have been inside any cordoned off area that we would have created. I'm not making that as an excuse, it's just the situation. He limps badly, the leg wound still bleeding. He has none of Phillips's determination to fight and is focused only on a desperate search for some way to escape. He edges his shattered car forward its windscreen so badly damaged that he has to drive with his head out of the door. Phillips abandons his AK-47 and prepares to make his last stand. Once again, John Caparelli decides to confront him. He started coming out without the AK, and I didn't really get a, a long look. But eventually, he did produce the 9mm. I fired several rounds, I went back for cover, then I came back out. After reloading and didn't realize that he had walked up closer and now he was just from one corner to the next. Caught me off guard. I mean, there was a split second there when I came out expecting him to still be by the truck that he's now facing me and I saw the gun, the arm, his, his eyes all lined up, and he fired a couple rounds as he dove out of the way, and luckily the rounds went into the car. We were all firing now from behind the car at him. When he fired those last two rounds at me, somebody there hit his hand. That was it for him. He basically said, this is it, I'm done. And that's when he, he picked it up and put it under his chin and uh, he put a round in himself as we were, you know, just peppering him. My immediate reaction was, who shot him? I didn't see any police officer in the bushes next to the sidewalk. I hadn't seen one before, didn't see one then, and I knew it was a close shot. Just by the nature of the shot, I could tell it was a very close shot. And it didn't dawn on me that Phillips had shot himself. I'm looking for a police officer that shot him, and I couldn't find him, and it, it, it bugged me. <laughs> we heard a, a weird uh, hissing sound coming from that direction. And we thought, with all else that was going on, that there might have been some kind of explosive device that you know, he was hooked up to, and he was, he was just going to blow. So we didn't approach. I mean, there were... Uh, several minutes we just kind of maintained our position and, and watched and the sound kept going and uh, I later found out it was one of the tires on the tractor trailer that had been hit and was losing air with Matasarenu still attempting to drive away along Archwood SWAT officers Rick Massa, Steve Gomez, and Don Anderson arrive at a police cordon. They pull out bulletproof armor at their M16 rifles. For the first time since the shooting began, the police will have firepower that can match the opposition. Okay, guys, AK 47s are armor piercing bullets. Keep your cover. Gomez, you go wide in the front of the car. Anderson, you take the back with me. The SWAT team is now racing towards a duel with Emil Matasarenu. Larry Phillips Jr. is the first fatality of the Hollywood shootout. Among the first to reach him is John Caparelli. We slowly approached and uh, when we got up to him, uh, there were three or four of us. You know, we turned him over and we handcuffed him. We took the ski mask off 
and he was obviously dead at that time. Just hit me. This is the guy. This is the guy that I've been listening to for 45 minutes. Further along Archwood, Emil Matasereno finally succeeds in hijacking another getaway vehicle. He fires several rounds at a 1961 Jeep pickup truck. Its driver, William Marr, sprints away from danger. Mata Serenu frantically moves his weapons and ammunition to the jeep. The keys have been left in the ignition, but when he tries to start the engine, nothing happens. Mata Serenu doesn't know that older trucks like this have a separate starter button. That unit is a metro unit, ma'am, and they're engaging the suspect. They're not able to back off. Mata Serenu retreats to the back of the car and loses his opportunity to get a clear shot at the SWAT officers. The SWAT officers fire underneath the vehicles, hitting Matasereno 29 times and shattering his left leg. He finally stopped shooting, laid his weapon down, and shortly thereafter the SWAT officers carefully and with good caution moved to a position where they could see him full on and move in and, and take him into custody. Very good job by those three officers. They did a hell of a job. It's amazing the, the, the tenacity with the guys that were getting fired at to stay in their positions to, to broadcast what was going on. And uh, I just got to mention what, what a job they did, I mean, you know. They mentioned, you know, there were 350 officers there, but you know what? It was 35 that held those guys in there. Serenu will die at the scene, slowly bleeding to death from multiple gunshot wounds. The only fatalities in the North Hollywood shootout were Larry Phillips Jr. and Emil Matasereno. But the casualty figures could have been much worse. The Los Angeles police were hopelessly outgunned, but many still took the fight to the robbers. That day we fought and we fought and we fought and it was literally like 200 little dark blue ants nibbling and biting on this humongous tarantula, you know, and little by little, we got them. Eleven police officers and seven civilians were wounded but the damage went beyond physical injuries. There was a lot of, a lot of stress, a lot of stress. Uh, I was waking up every night, 1, 1 1.30 every night, and going back and reliving, you know, what was happening and wondering, you know, why did that gun jam? What if it hadn't, you know? 
And what if I had just gotten one of those rounds, you know, that, that went past the body armor? I could have stopped it sooner. Just over and over and over again, you think about that. I was told, first responders, police officers, firefighters, you start out with an empty gas tank, and as you go through your career, the things that you see and do start filling that gas tank up. Yeah, there were three guys that I used to work with took their own lives. And it wasn't just because of that shootout, but for those of us that were there, we know that that was another little piece of filling the gas tank. After his terrible injury, Stuart Guy still has a titanium plate in his leg. He has now retired from the police. Detective Tracy Angeles and Officer James Borovan still serve in the Los Angeles Police Department. As does John Caparelli, the cop who faced down the gunman three times that February morning and emerged unscathed.